Good afternoon. Thank you so much for being with us this evening. I'm Janice Kaminer Resnick, and on behalf of Jews United for Democracy and Justice and Community Advocates, Inc., welcome to our program tonight. A special welcome to our guest, the extraordinary David Leonhart, and to our beloved Larry Mantle. Thank you both for helping us become smarter, more informed, and better Americans. Thanks to our leadership team, former Congressman Mel Levine, former LA County Supervisor Zev Yaroslavsky, David Lehrer, Caroline Kelly, and Rabbi Ken Chazen. The link to our 165 plus past programs is in every email we send out. If you're having trouble registering, I'm informed that the problem might be resolved if you clear your cash. I cannot help you with that, but your friends, kids, grandkids, great grandkids can. Let me know if it works. Otherwise, I will continue to be available to reg register those of you who can't register. Just can't register. All you need to do is reply to any Jews United email. It comes directly to me, and I will register you as those who have requested know that I will. Thank you to those who donate to help us present these programs. We are grateful. And of course, as long as you keep supporting us, we can continue presenting you with this amazing weekly series. Next week, we will hear from the always interesting political pundit, Bill Kristol, who will discuss budgets, primaries, and crimes. And this is a perfect week to be thinking about crimes. Where does it all lead? Bill will be in conversation with the always wonderful Pat Morrison of the Los Angeles Times. The following week, we are very excited to present Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer. In these very politically chaotic times, hearing from the governor of a key battleground state will be enlightening and will certainly add to our understanding of the political landscape. Now for a couple more announcements, my friend and colleague, David Lehrer. David? Thank you, Janice. And good evening to everyone. Tonight should be terrific. David Leonhardt, as the author of the New York Times Morning Newsletter, writes about topics from the debt ceiling to immigration to affirmative action to slavery, and that was just the beginning of the past week. He can discuss just about anything with knowledge and wisdom, and Larry Mantle is always on top of his game. Following up on the programs Janice just mentioned, on May 31, we bring back David's colleague, New York Times columnist Nick Kristoff, and KCRW's Madeline Brand to explore rays of hope in grim times. Kristoff is a two-time Pulitzer Prize winner. On June 7th, we'll examine important legal issues that range from Trump's several trials to the assault on voting rights to the future of the U.S. Supreme Court with one of the most able and engaging analysts of legal issues around the former Solicitor General of the United States, a very popular guest of ours, Neil Katyal, and he'll be in dialogue with Warren Olney. The rest of June will bring us the Washington Post, Max Boot, the New York Times Chief Washington Correspondent, Peter Baker, and The Atlantic and CNN's Ron Brownstein, truly the cream of the crop. Our moderator tonight is the incomparable Larry Mantle. Larry hosts Air Talk, the longest running daily talk show in LA radio history. He is the recipient of numerous national and local awards, including best public radio talk show in the nation from the public radio news directors. He's the best. Larry? David, thank you so much. Janice, thank you as well. It's such a pleasure to be with you again for America at a Crossroads. I look forward to these Wednesday afternoon, evening gatherings to be able to talk with some of the most important analysts that we find anywhere that help us make sense of what's going on in an increasingly confusing and ever more quickly moving world. And with that in mind, tonight's program is going to be kind of like the rapid fire round of uh, the old TV game shows. We have so much to cover over the course of the hour, even though it's a lot of time, we have many topics to cover. So we'll hopefully be going through those quickly, but with the kind of depth that you expect in these programs. David, it's great to have you back. Good to be with you again. Good to be with you. I always enjoy these conversations, Larry, and, and thank you to David and Janice for those very nice introductions. Let's start ripped from the headlines today, the arrest of New York Congressman George Santos. He pled not guilty to setting up a phony company to finance his lifestyle with campaign funds. He also denied that he fraudulently received unemployment benefits and that he lied to Congress. His federal indictment includes 13 counts. So at what point is it likely he's going to be ousted from Congress? I mean, it's not clear. Um, uh, you, you can serve in Congress while you were, have been indicted. There's sort of a long history of that. 
Um, and I think this is a situation in which I, I don't have any view of the of whether he is legally guilty. And I believe in the principle of of innocent until proven guilty in a legal sense. But in a political sense, the standard is quite different. And there is abundant evidence that he has lied multiple times, that in fact, his entire campaign was built on a series of lies about his biography. And so uh, I, I think that seems pretty clear that he is not qualified to serve in Congress. And the question becomes, does the Republican House majority choose to act on that? Or do they let him twist for a while uh, or longer? And, and then until there's a legal outcome or until he has to face the voters again, then there's an outcome. I would be very surprised if Representative Santos has a second term in Congress. Well, and in fact, just about an hour ago, I think it was House Speaker McCarthy said he would not support uh, the re-election effort of George Santos. Of course, that's very different than saying he should re resign immediately. Um, what are the political reasons why the Speaker hasn't come out more forcefully? Of course, he's been removed from his committee appointments, but, but beyond that, why there hasn't been more? It's not a safe Republican seat, and so and and so when we we've seen both parties um, uh, do shenanigans when there is something happening in in the middle of a cycle and things are closely divided, and so pretty clearly the Republicans would really like this not to flip to the Democrats. They're operating already with a very very slim margin, and I think we can debate. You know, do we wish it weren't? Do we wish that weren't the case? But um, I understand why given the stakes in American politics, I understand why parties are very reluctant to kick out one of their own one of their own members, particularly someone for whom there hasn't yet been a criminal indictment. I mean, this is an extreme case. His lies are so obvious. This isn't a, is it really corruption or is it, isn't it? You know, did he really do this thing he's accused of? I mean, it's very clear that, that the lies are absolutely abundant. And so, I guess what I would say is Speaker McCarthy is well within his rights to not to, to keep uh, Santos in Congress, and the rest of us are well within our rights to to call it what it is, which is an, a, a, an extremely cynical decision. Well, and, and we've obviously had members of Congress who have been accused of and convicted of corruption in the past, but uh, do we have any sort of a precedent for someone who seemingly completely fabricated a background as the candidate Santos did. That's a great question. I mean, American history is long <laughs> and we're a big, interesting country. So I'm I'm reluctant to say there's never been anything like this. I mean, there have been all kinds of fraudsters who've managed to make their way into elected office, but I but nothing is immediately coming to mind that quite fits uh that quite fits this scenario. Of course, we didn't have social media. We didn't. Not everybody was necessarily looked at to the degree that people are today. But it, it is extraordinary, certainly. Yesterday's debt ceiling meeting between congressional leaders and the president didn't seem to yield progress. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen warns the U.S. could default on its obligations by June first. Republicans want domestic spending cuts in exchange for voting to raise the ceiling. The cuts they proposed are, are seemingly non-starters for Democrats and the president. Is there reason to believe that either side is going to give some ground? We don't yet see any sign of either side giving ground. And there are strong arguments. I can come up with a strong argument for why neither side will. Um, uh, the the idea that Biden and the Democrats would make big compromises here on the debt ceiling is just a really problematic precedent. If they do that, the Republicans are going to come right back next year and, and ask for the same stuff. Um, it's going to embolden them. So it's not like uh, if they do some kind of compromise here, then they're done with it. Um, it only gets bigger. And And on the Republican side, um, it's worth remembering that McCarthy, as we were just talking about this, McCarthy has a very thin majority in Congress. And there are a whole bunch of Republicans who are really, really hardcore on spending. And so um, I think it's, I mean, it was hard for him to get this bill passed, which is, which is goes really far in cutting spending. And so I, I'm, I, this, I am genuinely uncertain what is going to happen here. I wrote a piece a while back saying that there are 100% stories, 50% stories, and I like to think of the debt ceiling as a 90% story. So to me, a 100% story is the planet is getting hotter. A 100% story is crime has risen. 
uh, compared to a few years ago. Inflation has risen. But th that's just reality. And if someone wants to claim that, you know, crime is not high, higher now than it was five years ago, that they're wrong, right? Then there are 50-50 stories in which we're really fighting about values. I mean, for the most part, the abortion fight is not a fight about facts, for the most part, right? Um, it's a fight about values. And I think about those as 50% stories because I, I think each side sort of has a pretty solid claim on the truth as much as they may disagree and as much as I'm guessing many of your listeners think that they're only on one of those sides. Um, but I think for the most part, people don't fight about the truth with abortion. What's tricky about the debt ceiling is no one side of the debate has a monopoly on the truth. It is true that Democrats have played games with the debt ceiling before Biden himself has voted against raising it. But it's also not a 50% story. And the reason I think it's a 90% story is the two parties have behaved very, very differently. Democrats have never, they've taken protest votes and they've said this isn't good. Democrats have never pushed anything to the brink or demanded major compromises from Republicans in exchange for, for passing the debt ceiling. And Republicans now have a, a more than decade long history of doing it. And so I absolutely understand why Democrats are basically saying no more. Look, this is not the budget. Congress has already passed budgets, Republicans and Democrats alike. This is some second weird stage in which it's like a family's bought a car and now they're deciding whether to pay the credit card bill. They've bought the car, right? You gotta pay the credit card bill. And, and it's just a really messy situation. And I, and I also understand why Biden and the White House are starting to look at pretty extreme legal measures, extreme legal steps, like the idea of saying the debt ceiling itself is unconstitutional and just issuing more debt, because this could be economically devastating for the country. And I want to get to the 14th Amendment and that issue, of, you know, whether the president acts unilaterally, which, as you said, apparently under consideration within the White House. But I was reading a, an interesting piece by um, a former congressman. He used to be a Republican. He's he's not at this point. Um, he's a professor of economics and law at Chapman University here in Southern California. And Campbell, writing in an op-ed in the SoCal uh, newspaper group, wrote that the you know, 14th Amendment is clear and that holders of U.S. debt must be paid under the 14th Amendment. And he's making the point that really the only leverage remaining to cut the budget, the only thing that would make Democrats be willing to cut spending, is to hold the debt ceiling as leverage. And he compared to the 1985 graham rudman hollings Act that uh, wasn't renewed, but that cut the de deficit over a period of years, in fact, balance the budget one of those years, because it forced cuts uh, as a part of law. So his argument is, you know, th there really is no other leverage, and he would probably say by extension, though maybe 90% that Republicans use it, it's Republicans who are trying, the party trying to cut spending, it's not Democrats, so Democrats wouldn't use it in the same way. Your thoughts about that? Well, so we can come back to the constitutional debate if you want, because I think that's that's messy. Yeah, we will definitely, yeah. Um, but uh, Democrats have policy priorities as well. Just just because it's not cutting spending doesn't mean they don't have policy priorities. When Donald Trump was president, Democrats could have said, "We're not lifting the debt ceiling unless you um, uh, fund measures to slow climate change." because it is by far the biggest threat humanity faces. And we absolutely won't do it unless you address climate change. So the idea that each party has their priorities, but you could always use the, you could always use the debt ceiling as, as political ransom to demand what you want. Um, it's not just about cutting spending. So I think that's just sort of, I, I, think, I, I think it's, I don't buy his argument logically on either count, right? I, I also do think Republicans have other leverage. Um, uh, the U.S. government can't just keep operating. Republicans now tr control the House of Representatives. They can do this over budgets to keep the government funded. I mean, they can shut down the government if the Democrats are not willing to, um, to make spending cuts. And that's now the second track of negotiations th that are happening. So I think the U.S. has gotten itself into a really bad situation with this, with this debt ceiling law. It, it, it really is, the metaphor I gave, it really is like a family buys a car and then decides whether to pay the bill. That's the debt ceiling is the second of those two. And in any kind of healthy organization or household or country, the decision is whether to buy something. <laughs> it's whether to spend money and it's whether to work more to make more money, right? It's not once you've done it, do you pay the bills? And I think the 
strategic mistake the Democrats made here is when they had control of Congress uh, in the first two years of the Biden presidency, they, they there's nothing that stopped them from lifting the debt ceiling to to you know as Dr. Evil might have said you know four hundred trillion dollars. Uh, they could have lifted it to anything they want. Now my understanding is that Senator Manchin from West Virginia and Senator Sinema from Arizona um, were against doing that. But I I think that this is this is so politically damaging to the country and the economic consequences could, could should, are so large. That, that really the next time, uh, I would say either party has universal control, uh, they should effectively get rid of this law. There's, a, there's basically no other country in the world that does this. Um, Denmark is the only one, right? <laughs> Denmark is the only one. Yeah. And they take care of it like long in advance and they don't fight over it and no one says like, you know, I mean, this is basically going back on our, on our promises to pay to pay people for money we've already borrowed. And that's why I find the argument in favor of, of doing it quite weak. Look, I get that politics ain't a dinner party, right? To, to paraphrase Mao, say Tong. So I understand why one party might want to kind of use this really hardball measure. I, I don't think it's appropriate, but if one party is going to use a hardball measure, well, then we shouldn't be surprised if the other party decides to use a hardball measure to prevent the economy from, from going into a, a really, really bad situation. But I, I think what, what, um, what the other side, what, what the Republican argument is, or at least some Republicans is, you still pay the debt with what you've got. You still pay bondholders, people who are obligated as a result of, of, of U.S. debt. But what you do is slash government across the board, the size of it. That's how you would fund paying that since you can't borrow anymore. Now, of course, if you were to do that, then you'd have to ask, well, how would Republicans feel about defense? And um, what about Social Security? What about other obligations beyond simply debt? And that's where it would get really hairy politically, even on that level. Yeah, I don't have any problem with people fighting over these over these policies. Like, I don't have any problem with Republicans coming in and saying we should leave Social Security constant, we should grow defense five percent, and we should cut everything else twenty five percent, or or pick your numbers. Like, that's a reasonable policy position. I, I don't think economic history suggests it's actually the best way to get past economic growth, but it's a reasonable policy position. I, I think the problem is those are the decisions you make up front, right? And this really isn't about that. This really is about these are already bills we've accumulated. We've accumulated them through Joe Biden's spending. We've accumulated them through Donald Trump's tax cuts. We've accumulated them through Donald Trump's enormous spending uh, on COVID and, and on other things. We've accumulated them through Barack Obama and George W. Bush. And the idea that our country would basically say, oh yeah, Congress passed all those laws for those tax cuts and those spending, but now we're not gonna pay you back. It's not how the world, it's not how one of the most powerful countries in the world is supposed to behave. And, and David, let's let's talk now about the 14th Amendment. Uh, Treasury Secretary Yellen said invoking the 14th Amendment and um, uh, that, that that would be um, uh, if a default uh, occurred and if the 14th Amendment was in, invoked, that um, this would be a constitutional crisis. Now, the 14th Amendment, uh, which says the public debt shall not be questioned, essentially, um, saying that the obligation exists as, as a constitutional amendment. What do you think would happen if the president invoked that amendment and said it supersedes the ability of Congress uh, uh, or, or the, the, uh, the need for it to raise the debt ceiling to engage in borrowing? And so just to do the facts for one second, you just did them really nicely there. I'll just continue it a little bit. Yeah. The amendment says the debt shall not be questioned. Now, how do you interpret that, right? One way to interpret that is that it means that we need to pay our debts and, and that us having a law that says we actually don't need to pay our debts, which is what the existence of the debt ceiling says, um, is unconstitutional. And uh, there was an interesting uh, podcast discussion on the Dispatch, uh, which is a, a really good news website, leans to the right politically. And um, it was a conversation between David French, um, uh, who is actually now my colleague at the New York Times, he used to work at the Dispatch, and some other folks there. And it, he had this nice line where he said that 
that using the 14th Amendment to ignore the debt ceiling may be the least unconstitutional of the various options here. And his argument was that it is still unconstitutional because you're basically, you're going around Congress's power of the purse. Only Congress has the power to tax and to spend, and you're effectively going around that. But you're not violating what, what David, um, who's a lawyer, which doesn't make him right, what David views is, is like a pretty clear charge in that amendment that, um, that the, the country needs to pay off its debt. So, so that's sort of the question there. there we're never going to get to some answer on this is a constitutional that's absolutely right. For a long time, most people said, eh, that's not really fine. Now, more people are starting to say, eh, actually, maybe it is. Um, what would happen? I think two things would happen. I think um, the market investors would be not sure whether this newly issued debt was actually legit or whether uh, it would later be ruled illegal by the courts. And so um, when debt is riskier, it has, comes with higher interest rates. And so I think interest rates would go up and I think the economy would feel the effect. Now, as Jason Furman, an economist who is in the Obama administration, has said, interest rates would go up a lot less than they'd go up if we breached the debt ceiling. Um, so it wouldn't be great economically, but it would be a lot less bad than, than reneging on our debts and, and causing it. And then I think the second thing that would happen is, you, obviously, you would have immediate lawsuits from Republicans in Congress, from others. And so I think in short order, the Supreme Court would make this decision. Uh, Lawrence uh, Tribe, the emeritus professor, Harvard Law, writing uh, op-ed in the New York Times, uh, said he used to hold the view that it wouldn't be appropriate to use the 14th uh, to circumvent the debt ceiling. He said he's now changed his view and, and that he thinks that the, that the president's duty is executing laws, and that includes spending laws, bills the Congress has passed for expenditures, and, and argues that the president should just uh, come out and forcefully announce he's going to do it. He's going to honor all, all of that spending and the debt and essentially ignore the, the debt ceiling. Th that too, whether it's based on the 14th Amendment or not, would presumably lead to immediate litigation. Yeah, and I think everything about Joe Biden's history suggests he's not going to do that today or tomorrow. He's only, if he does that, and he may not be willing to do it at all, if he does it, he'll do it only basically at the last minute when he thinks a crisis is absolutely going to be there. What I would say is, 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 is this 14th Amendment solution a, a, a radical solution? Yes, it is. <laughs> is, is, choosing to let the country violate its debt ceiling, a radical policy? Yes, they both are. And so this is a situation, it's actually sort of, I don't like the word interesting because it doesn't really say very much, and, and, but, I'm, but I'm failing to come up with, with a different one here. I'm struck, Republicans have been much more willing to use kind of extreme political tactics than Democrats in the last decade. I mean, think about Senate Republicans refusing to let a Democratic president fill a Supreme Court seat, right? You know, basically, there's there's no precedent for that. Um, uh, you know, think about Republicans in Wisconsin after they lose the governor's election, they change the law to make the governor's office less powerful. You can't really find any examples of Democrats losing a governor's office in modern history and then changing the law to make the office less powerful. And so Republicans have been much more comfortable with really hardball political tactics. And I think the question now is, do Democrats basically decide um, hey, we're gonna, we're now gonna respond with the same kind of aggressiveness um, that Republicans have tried, um, and then of course you're gonna have a Republican-controlled Supreme Court that's gonna end up making the decision, and and I don't know what's gonna happen at that point if it happens. Well, this this kind of an aside, but do, do you think that Harry Reid's uh, leadership on doing away with the filibuster for for the federal judges? that Democrats felt somewhat burned by that down the road, and, and of course with the Supreme Court nominations as well, so that that's made Democrats more gun shy about that? I don't. I think that with the filibuster, you've basically seen kind of an arms race on it. Um, and um, the Republicans became much, much more aggressive about the filibuster than the Democrats did, right? So how- this was not set it in motion, you, you have to grant that. No, no, no. Reed was responding to the Republicans' aggressiveness on the filibuster, right? 
So Republicans were using the filibuster much, much, much more than the Democrats were. And I want to be clear. I see what you're saying. Okay. That's not because Republicans are worse people than Democrats. The filibuster is inherently the friend of conservatives, right? Think about it. The filibuster sure. makes laws harder to pass. Conservatives want the government doing less. Liberals want the government doing more. And so over time, Republicans became increasingly aggressive about using the filibuster and were, were basically blocking. Democrats did it too to George W. Bush, but not in the same numbers. And so to me, there was kind of an escalating war between the two parties. They were both doing it. Republicans were somewhat more aggressive. Harry Reid was faced with a very, very clear choice. Do I basically... Is do I accept that the president of the United States, Barack Obama, is not allowed to fill multiple appellate court judges? That was his choice. And he decided to go around it. I don't really buy the idea that if Harry Reid had not done that, R Republicans would have been tame over the next couple of years. I don't think that's kind of consistent with the history that we had. And so Reid's was definitely aggressive. And so if you're saying to me, well, wait a second, haven't Democrats done some aggressive stuff too? They have. The Reid thing well, is a good yeah. one. But and I, I don't just, think it's a matter of tame. It's, it's the Reed. issue created Republican aggressiveness. Did, did he give them additional ammunition, essentially, when it came to court issue? But, but let's move on to talk about the uh, tomorrow, the expiration of the pandemic era immigration policy, Title 42, significant increase expected in migrants heading for the U.S.-Mexico border. How is the Biden administration going to respond to this? Well, so what they've done is they've, they've tried to announce tougher new policies um, uh, so that it's not so easy for people to come in the country. To pe Migrants have learned that if they say they fear going back home, they are more likely to be allowed to stay. And so even migrants who, in fact, don't fear going back home and are coming here for work are now more likely to say they fear going back home. Now, of course, there are some who legitimately do fear going back home. Um, uh, but um, the Biden administration has tried to put in place some policies to do it. The Democrats, I think, are in a really hard place on immigration. I don't think the party really has a cohesive policy on immigration at this point, the Democratic Party. I think large parts of the party basically no longer believe in very much immigration enforcement, but aren't quite comfortable saying that, right? So imagine asking progressive Democrats, who in this country do you think should be deported? Who's here now? I think the answer for many of them is almost no one. They think almost no one should be deported, right? So if you get here, you should be able to stay here regardless of circumstance. I don't, they don't like to put it that way, but like tr try to find a progressive Democrat talking about who should be deported. And, and it's not a very long list, right? Or to put it another way, ask progressive Democrats of all these people who show up at the border, who should we admit and who should we keep out? Progressive Democrats have a very, many Democrats have a very hard time at this point answering the question, who should we keep out? They say, and they're not wrong about some of this stuff, these are desperate people. Um, they're, trying to, they're trying to come for a better life. And those things are true. The problem is the kind of the, the sort of new, it's not the whole Democratic Party, Biden is not there, but much of the Democratic Party now believes in relatively little immigration enforcement. And the, the issue that that presents is that message kind of gets out around the world and it causes many more people to try to enter this country. And we end up with a situation where we have much, much more immigration than in fact our federal laws say that we are supposed to have. And I think this is a situation in which Republicans have done some extreme things on immigration. Republicans have used horribly racist language. Donald Trump's family separation policy was incredibly cruel. So I'm not saying Republicans kind of have a monopoly on reality in the immigration debate. But if you look at the basic party positions, the Democratic Party position of relatively little immigration enforcement is really not on the side of public opinion. And I think Democrats are making a mistake if they think that this talk of border security is a, is a ploy for Republicans just to appeal to their Fox News base. The idea of pretty tough border security is actually popular with most Americans. And I think Democrats are in a little bit of a tough spot here. Biden has tried to moderate this position by being more in favor of enforcement than many other Democrats. And that's why you saw in January, after he announced these new, met, these new measures to make it harder for, for people to come into this country without legal permission, a, a lot of activists on the left, 
a lot of progressive Democrats criticized him as cruel. But guess what else happened after he announced those measures? The number of people trying to enter the country, country illegally dropped significantly because people got the message that getting into the US without permission was no longer as easy as it was. And I, I think this is a hard thing. My prediction, and then I'll be quiet, is yeah, when no, he's right. the job, I think Biden is going to be willing to uh, disappoint other Democrats and um, and do more border enforcement than the rest of his party would like. The challenge, though, I think is going to be when you have families that arrive from Central America or elsewhere who it's determined through the asylum process are here for economic opportunity, not because they're fleeing political oppression. And you see those families and, and them in the process of deportation. That's that's going to be very difficult for a significant segment of the American public to see that. There'll be response to that. That's also going to put political pressure on the president. Yeah, it is. Um, I agree. I mean, the thing that should, to me, should be a very basic principle is we don't separate families, right? So you, you don't keep some people here and deport others. I, I think it's a reminder, though, of why having a, a border that is understood to be difficult to get in has many political benefits. Fewer people will make that dangerous journey if they think they are likely to fail to get in, right? And so it's a little bit like the debt ceiling in some ways. It, it, if, if Biden says, okay, let's just let lots of people in now, what happens? More people are going to show up at the border. And so there's a way in which having a relatively porous border can create its own humanitarian problems. You get, you get huge numbers of people in, in, in border towns in both Mexico and the United States in conditions that are not safe. And, and so I think, I, I don't think this is a case in which the humanitarian solution is um, allow anyone in or most people who want to come. Uh, and the cruel solution is to not. I, I think both of them have real, real costs, human costs. And I think it's something that the Democratic Party right now is is just struggling to think about. Well, the other the other part, David, is that the asylum process doesn't have the capacity to handle the you know tens of thousands of people that we're talking about. The delay for people, even with expedited hearings, is going to be so long, putting those families in total flux. And and if uh, you know you've got people that are waiting in Mexico to come into the United States under what could be very dangerous and uh, deprived settings. You know, it, that's not good humanitarian wise either. No, it's not. And look, I, you know, to me, the United States has a long history of being a beacon for people who are fleeing political oppression. And, and that is a very important principle for our country. The thing that's hard is, again, there is no country in the world that I'm aware of that allows economic asylum, right? Um, that is that really is pretty much equivalent to an open border, right? For a rich country, right? If 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 Japan, which is extremely conservative on immigration, or South Korea, which is extremely conservative on immigration, or Western Europe, which is less so but becoming more conservative, or the United States, if any of those countries said we allow economic asylum, which is mean you can move here if you if you live in a country that has less good job opportunities than we do you would see millions of people try to get into these countries. And those people would not be, they would be doing something completely rational. But at a certain point, countries have to think about what actually is our immigration policy. And every country in the world has decided that having an enforced border is part of their immigration policy. And the U.S. is struggling with that a little bit right now. We're going to take a viewer questions in just a few minutes, but I want to remind you that you can, of course, uh, ask us a question. I ask you please to include your first name and your location, just so we have a sense of where your question's coming from. You, of course, of course put that in the Q&A on the screen and ask your question of, of David. I want to move on to talk about an uh, important Supreme Court case you've re recently written about, affirmative action in higher education. Um, you re recently wrote about how family economic economic history or, or ancestors being enslaved could potentially take the place of racial and ethnic affirmative action, with a high court's conservative majority seemingly poised to end race-based affirmative action in higher ed. Uh, how might economic challenges be used in lieu of that? 
So I do think the Supreme Court is likely to um, ban or uh, tightly, tightly restrict the use of uh, race itself in college admissions. But that piece that you just mentioned, I opened it with uh, uh, an exchange that was led by Justice Kavanaugh. And I listened to all five hours of the Supreme Court arguments. And I really, really recommend it um, to anyone who's interested in this. You can do it on the Supreme Court's website. If you're a podcast listener and you've kind of, you know, you're looking for a different kind of podcast, listening to the five hours of the Supreme Court. And if you get bored after different. One, <laughs> if you get bored after one or two, you can give up. But but I re it, not only is it interesting in its own right, and my guess is much of your audience is inherently interested in affirmative action, but the Supreme Court justices are really important people in our national lives, and you actually don't hear them talk very much, right? They're not like the president or like Mitch McConnell or Chuck Schumer, and you're constantly seeing them on the news. And so just listening, being able to listen to them talk and listen to them think out loud, I just found really fascinating. And so during this, you know, about three hours in, Justice Kavanaugh said to a, a lawyer who you'd think he'd be friendly to. This was the conservative lawyer arguing for the end of race-based affirmative action. He said, well, would if you were a descendant of slaves um, and a university gave you a benefit for that, is that race-based? And the lawyer sort of stammered and said, uh, yeah, I think that would be race-based. And Kavanaugh said, well, wait a second. You just agreed that after the Civil War, the benefits to formerly enslaved people were not race-based. They were based on their category of being enslaved. Um, as a mathematician might say, they, they were kind of taking race out of both sides of the equation here, right? They were obviously enslaved because of their race. Um, and, and the lawyer didn't have a very good answer to that. And I assume there is a good chance that the, the Supreme Court is gonna decide this in such a way where they make it very difficult to take to, to include something like um, having an ancestor who was enslaved because that it feels very close to race. But who knows? And then you start to get into a bunch of other things that are that are not binary, the way uh, the way family uh, the family status of enslavement is. So this country has a long history of housing subsidies that were overwhelmingly for white people. And I don't just mean like white people happen to get them. I mean, the federal government created housing subsidies and wrote and established them and ran them in such a way after World War II that black people couldn't get them. I mean, they really were for white people. There were all these developments like Levittown in Long Island that were whites only. And those are the kinds of developments that the federal government really financed. And that has had this very long legacy in which it's a major reason that white families are so much wealthier than black families. So imagine in college admissions, you said, we are going to base whether you get an advantage based on how poor the neighborhood you grew up in is. Now, I think most Americans, if they just heard that, would say, well, that seems fair, right? A kid who grows up in a rich, a rich neighborhood and gets a, a 1390 on the SAT, gets a 1400 on the SAT, that's actually not as impressive as a kid who grew up in a poor neighborhood and got a 1390, right? Um, so I think we might de debate exactly how much, but most Americans polls show are really okay with the idea of economic affirmative action. Our country is so segregated and it has so many, uh, such large racial disparities, some of them caused by government policies, that if you started designing affirmative action programs based on wealth, many of them treat the races very differently. And so my point in that article was, I actually don't think it's gonna be quite so easy um, for conservatives to wipe the slate clean of the policies that, that many of them don't like, um, even with the Supreme Court decision. David, uh, President Biden, during his term in office, uh, has held few news conferences. He hasn't given a, a lot of interviews during, during his term in office. And news media are typically quite outspoken about that. And, uh, you know, uh, say the president's ducking media and all. It seems to me comparatively media has been a, a bit easier on Joe Biden. I don't know whether that's age related or not, but your thoughts about the strategy of the president and his team keeping him uh, so much away from media during uh, these three years. I don't know how to, I, I would wanna see someone who's an academic study how hard or not hard the press has been on Biden. Um, I mean, I just wrote a piece about immigration that I know the White House really didn't like. 
<laughs> I wrote a piece about, uh, you know, how old Biden is and and how few news conferences he's given that I know they didn't like. And so- Well, I so, didn't mean overall criticism. I meant about the issue of news conferences. That's what I was speaking of. You mean the media has been easy on him on news conferences? Yeah, I don't think, I. it seems to me that when we, we've had long periods of, of previous presidents who you've gone without news conferences, we've heard a lot more about it. Like, where's the president? Why isn't he, why isn't he addressing media? You might be right. I, I know the Times has written a bunch about how few news conferences Biden has held. There's been an editorial. There's been a news story. I've written a piece. So, um, but, I, but I'm open to the idea that we wrote about it more with Reagan, who was also, you know, didn't have many news conferences. I, to me, the bigger question is, look, if Biden were shunning the traditional news media because he thought we just weren't as important as we used to be, we're not as important as we used to be. We're just not. Like, you know, back in the old days, there was there were only a couple of national newspapers and a couple of networks. And, you know, now you can read anything you want. Um, if Biden were out there talking just as much in public as other presidents, as past presidents, to me, if we at the, the New York Times or NPR or the Wall Street Journal were complaining uh, about how often he was talking, it'd be kind of a weak complaint, right? We'd be, as they say in finance, we'd be talking our own book. Um, but I think the issue is he's just talking less in public, including, you know, he's not doing town halls. He's not, you know, he's not doing interviews with, you know, chefs. <laughs> and I, I, to me, he still looks very mentally sharp. Um, physically, he looks like someone who's 80, which he is. Um, he still looks very mentally sharp. But what I don't understand to me is uh, if the White House wants to prove uh, that Joe Biden uh, is as sharp as they say he is, why are they having him engage less with the public than other presidents? I, I think well, he's, I he's always been gaff prone. That, Even as a young man, he was gaff prone. That's the answer, right? But the problem is, given that he would be by far the oldest president ever if he wins the second term, although Donald Trump isn't actually that much younger, um, uh, it seems to me that there is some burden on him to do this. Now, we have recent history in this that is both deeply alarming and you could argue, well, maybe less alarming. I mean, Ronald Reagan was really significantly compromised in, in his final couple of years in office. Um, now, that to me is a very dangerous thing to have a president of the United States who's significantly compromised. Some people would say yes, and that's why Iran-Contra happened. I, my reading of the history is a little different. Iran-Contra was a, was a significant mistake by Reagan, but I don't think it came because of the early signs of dementia. And, you know, if you kind of look back in the general scope of history and say, how did the United States government function in 1987 and 1988? I would actually say it functioned extremely well in 1987 and 1988. It was a really, really important time for the world because of the early signs of decline of the Soviet Union. And the Reagan administration managed it really well. And so, look, if Biden is actually at risk of decline, that is certainly a major factor that, 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 that voters should think about. Um, but, but it is kind of funny to think about that twice in the last century, Reagan and FDR, who really was dying in his last year in office, We've had the government function extremely well with um, with very compromised presidents. I don't really know what to make of that. Yeah, have you spoken with him during his his term in office? I have. I have. Yeah, and what's what's your sense of him? I thought he was very sharp. I mean, you know, physically, again, he's eighty. Like he doesn't have the same gait that he used to. Um, he uh, he talks a little bit more quietly uh, than he used to. Um, he used to really dominate a room. Um, uh, uh, with his speech, and now it's you know it's a little bit less so. Um, but you know he's still he's still who he's long been. Like he you know he likes to tell long stories, kind of starts in one direction and goes in another direction. None of that's new. I mean, as you you pointed out, the gaps. You know, uh, none of that's new. And so um, what I, the way I would say it is to me, physically, he clearly looks older than when he was vice president. You feel that. If you're in his presence, um, I'm not a doctor. Um, I saw absolutely no sign in, in of any mental uh, of any mental diminution. Let's uh, let's take some fewer questions. Susan asks, "What would be the political consequence?" You you talked about uh, the high stakes um, internationally and economically, but what would be the political consequence of a government shutdown? Yeah, it's a great question, and I. Um, 
if if we journalists and pundits weren't already humble about our ability to predict political uh, consequences, I would hope the last uh, seven or eight years had made us so, right? Not just Trump's election, but but the fact that the Democrats did much better than history suggested they should in, in this midterm. So I really don't know. My, my starting point is usually that chaos is bad for the party that holds the White House. But it seems like under both Clinton and Obama, the first shutdown of the government that the Republicans did under Clinton, and then the debt ceiling threats that the Republicans made under Obama, it seems that that hurt the Republicans more than the Democrats. So that really makes me unsure what the situation is. The thing I would feel most comfortable saying is most Americans have made up their minds about politics. So we're talking about a very small percentage of people here, right? I mean, I would ask most of your audience, if a leading figure in your party was discovered to have done something really bad, what's the odds that you would then vote for the other party? I think it's small, right? That's how polarized we are as a country. And so the, the small percentage of people who are affected by this stuff just happen to determine elections. So they really, really matter. But it's not going to change. You pick the number. 90% of people's views about Joe Biden and Kevin McCarthy, it's not going to change 90% of their views. And, and because the group is so small, and because this is a situation that we've never had before, I find it really hard to guess who's going to suffer more from this. I, I find it less hard to say the economy will suffer. Uh, Janice asks, will there be any consequences for Justice Clarence Thomas's ethical transgressions? In the short term and the medium term, no. Um, the Supreme Court is essentially, uh, it, it, because of separation of powers, the other branches of government cannot easily discipline the Supreme Court. You may have seen some Senate Democrats invited John Roberts to testify about ethics of the Supreme Court, which wasn't even sanctions. And Roberts said, sorry, separation of power is not a good idea. Um, so look, could could the Senate impeach, uh, uh, could, could a justice be impeached and then convicted in the Senate? Yes, but that's not going to happen for the same reason we were just discussing, how polarized we were, uh, we are as a country. Um, but I don't want to be completely nihilist about this. The reputation of the Supreme Court matters. And we saw that most clearly during the 1930s, when the Supreme Court still had the power to rule Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal agenda unconstitutional. But Roosevelt had threatened to add justices, which didn't narrowly succeed, but did seem to, he had just been reelected by a huge landslide, the Supreme Court seemed really wary of taking on such a popular president. And lo and behold, they stopped overturning all of Roosevelt's New Deal policies. The analogy is not perfect, but I think a Supreme Court that has come to, seen, come to be seen as less respectable, more partisan, less above the fray, um, uh, more interested in their own personal finances, I think that will, will in small ways weaken the Supreme Court and if you think that in the next 10 years, we might have a substantial conflict between a Democratic president and Congress and a Republican controlled Supreme Court, I think Thomas's problems are bad for the Supreme Court. And I would guess that John Roberts is deeply unhappy about them, even if publicly he's just going to back Thomas. Another question comes from... Um... Uh, Judge Joe, who asks, uh, we're nearing full employment. Are there jobs for all of the immigrants who would be coming to the United States with loosened uh, borders into the U.S.? I, I think that um, there probably are jobs for many, many of them. I mean, economies are not static. They are dynamic. And when, when a population grows, you don't run out of jobs. You have more people who need more things. Um, and so I don't think that we would have a situation. I don't think we are likely to have a situation in which uh, an increase in immigration leads to mass unemployment. Having said that, if you believe in the laws of economics, when the supply of something goes up um, and the demand for it stays roughly the same, the price of it falls. 
And this to me is another example of something where I think Democrats have sort of had a hard time thinking about this. The notion that bringing more people into the country particularly if they would be relatively low or middle wage workers. The notion that that has no effect on the low and middle wage workers who are already here, to me sort of defies belief. Um, and when economists have studied this, they get into lots of fights, but when the National Academy of Sciences put out a paper on the effects of immigration on wages, there's this big table, most of the numbers in it are negative. And so all else equal, I think having higher levels of immigration um, uh, probably leads to less wage growth. And, and, and if, if all that sounds too complicated, what I would remind you of is many progressives like to celebrate the decades after World War II when wages grew a lot and inequality fell. Those were also the decades in which we had very restrictive immigration policy. Now, the history of that immigration policy is pretty ugly. But the fact is very few people from anywhere were coming into the world during, coming into the US during those decades. The last few decades have been a period of historically high immigration and rising inequality. Immigration is not the main reason. The decline of labor unions is more important. The stagnation of educational achievement is more important. Immigration is just not the main reason. But I think what you often hear on the political left today is that immigration plays, has no effect on wages. And I don't think that's consistent with the evidence. Well, and, and we have seen, of course, since the start of the pandemic, we've seen wages rise. And where the increase has been greatest is at the lower end of the pay scale. And arguably, that's been driven by the shortage of labor. So right. um, that, I mean, that's, there have been great gains in the past couple of years. That's right. And the pandemic did lead to a temporary decline in immigration. And one of the ways you can see the effects most clearly is um, some of the, the most direct competition between immigrants and workers is between teens who are already in this country, um, uh, including immigrant teens who are already in the country and native born teens who are already in the country and, and new immigrants. They're often the kinds of jobs that both groups do. Um, and and teen wages uh, and teen jobs have gone up by a lot. Now, there's a whole separate question. Do we actually want a lot of teens working? I'm not sure we do. But, but, but to me, there's abundant evidence that even if we can't be sure exactly how much, um, if, if your biggest priority is lifting the wages of poor and working class people who are already in this country, both immigrants and citizens, um, large amounts of new immigration uh, pushes against that a little bit. Now, maybe it has other benefits that, that people think outweigh that. Um, but basically, if you want inequality falling, um, lower levels of immigration are historically uh, uh, friendly to, to inequality falling. Well, a lot of us, you know, back to teens working, a lot of us worked when we went to school. Of course, school is much more demanding now than it used to be. So it, it can be tougher to hold a job while you're also going to school. Um, Greg asks, what do you think will be the fallout from uh, former President Trump's appearance with the CNN town hall tonight? Uh, he hasn't been on it, has he yet? I haven't watched it. If you I know. haven't. Yeah, we've been busy here. So I, well, we've been, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I, I don't know. Um, I think it's, it, you know, as with the debt ceiling, it's just really hard to know. I, the, the, the two forces with Trump, they're just these two dynamics and which one's going to win. Um, he has this large base of support that shows, again, not a lot of signs of weakening. It seems to be a large enough base of support to win the Republican nomination. He is not popular with swing voters. And I know there was one poll that just came out and it was a good poll uh, showing that he would beat Biden. Um, but that's not, most of the evidence, I mean, is Trump lost the popular vote to Hillary Clinton. Uh, his party did poorly in the midterms when he was in office. He then lost both the popular vote and the election to Joe Biden. The candidates Trump endorsed in, in, in 2022 um, did very poorly. Um, uh, I mean, there was like a noticeable Trump effect in which if he really, really pushed a candidate, they did like close to five percentage points worse than, than a garden variety Republican. Um, and so Donald Trump still has a ton of support uh, among his base and he continues to be largely unpopular with swing voters. Now, 
if he got the nomination, could he nonetheless win the presidency? Absolutely, right? He absolutely could because we're a closely divided country, because Republicans have some advantages in the Electoral College. It, you know, it, you can imagine if the economy's in the tank, if COVID somehow comes back, which seems highly unlikely, you know, if, if there's some big problem or not, and basically people are really unhappy with Biden, or they don't get any happier because Americans aren't that happy right now, could Donald Trump win the presidency? Absolutely. Um, but he does not look like the strongest possible candidate that Republicans could nominate. Well, and and given the fact that he lost the election to Biden, at least you know, when we, we look at the postmortem of that, um, in large part because suburban women abandoned Trump, yeah, I mean, is there any evidence that they would go back to him? Uh, I don't see a lot of evidence. I mean, so I'll give you the argument. The argument is that Biden was kind of an empty vessel, right? I mean, I, I know he wasn't. He'd been in public life for, you know, many, many decades, but he hadn't been president, you know, um, and traditionally an election is a referendum on the incumbent president when the incumbent president runs. Now, this would be a weird situation in which, you know, we'd have the last two incumbent presidents running, uh, not something we've had, I think, since the 19th century. Um, uh, and so it, it's really hard to know what goes on. But the argument would be that Biden as president is less popular than Biden as candidate, and Trump would need to shift only a small percentage of the 2020 vote um, to win the election. That's the argument. All right. Uh, David, we are just about out of time. I want to give you a chance, and it's hard, I know, because we've talked about so many topics that are just front and center in the news today. Um, but just a final thought about um, what you're going to be writing about and what you think, are, you know, within a minute or so, important issue for us to keep our eye on. Well, look, I, I've written before about how we in journalism have a bad news bias, right? And in part, that's our job, right? The sun comes up today, tomorrow. That's not a story. If it didn't come up, that would be a story, right? So in part, you want us having a bad news bias. You want us being skeptical when, when politicians and CEOs and movie stars tell us things. You don't want us to just immediately believe it. Um, but I also think we go too far sometimes. And so I, just to, to kind of wrap up, I think it's worth remembering there's, there are also a lot of things that have been going very well in this country recently, even though it doesn't always feel it. I'm not going to try to persuade you that most things are going well in this country. I don't think they are. But I mean, we've talked a lot about immigration in this. Um, you know, there's this fascinating book called Streets of Gold by two economists in which they really dig into the data. The last the, the immigrant families over the last few decades are ascending the ladder. Um, whatever the downsides of immigration might be, those immigrant families are ascending the ladder at almost an identical rate um, to the earlier immigrant families from the late 1800s and early 1900s. And so it is not the case that we have some permanent underclass of immigrants. The new group of immigrants are, are, are their families are doing really well. The people who come often remain poor, but their kids and grandkids do great. That's good news. We should be really happy about that. Um, it's also good news that, that despite what many people expected, um, uh, President Biden was able to pass a huge amount of legislation, including climate legislation, which I think will be his most important legacy in his first two terms. Some of it was down the line Democratic legislation, but a lot of it was bipartisan. And for someone who, who followed Washington during the Obama years, I genuinely didn't think it would be possible for there to be a lot of bipartisan le legislation, but there was. Um, and so, I, I, you know, we could name a few other things like that. You mentioned, Larry, the idea that low wage, the wages for low wage workers have gone up a fair bit over the last couple of years. Now it doesn't reverse the last 30 years um, and inflation has been high, but, you know, let's sort of celebrate it while we've got it. And and I think for people trying to think through what are our biggest problems, I would just encourage all of you, focus on the problems, get angry about the things that, that our society can fix and it isn't fixing, like mass shootings. Um, but also remember that it's not simply the case that everything's getting worse and some major parts of American life have gotten a lot better over the last generation or two. And we've even seen significant progress on important issues over the last few years. And the only way to make more progress is not to give up and basically to believe that, that this country continue, can continue to do things better in the future than we've done in the past. David, thank you so much. It's been a wonderful hour. It's always a pleasure to talk with you and to read your work on a daily basis in the New York Times. Thanks so much for, for being our guest on America at a Crossroads. 
Thanks for having me and thanks for the great questions. I really enjoyed the conversation. I really appreciated the conversation. And we want to ask you to please to show your appreciation for these programs, the terrific guests that are scheduled uh, in this collaboration between Jews United for Democracy and Justice and Community Advocates, Inc. by supporting either of those organizations which fund these programs that come your way every Wednesday evening. Now, next week, Los Angeles Times columnist Pat Morrison will talk with noted pundit and activist Bill Crystal, a frequent guest here on America to Crossroads. Budgets, primaries, and crimes, where does it all lead? That's with Bill Crystal and Pat Morrison next Wednesday, May 17th, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. Good night. Have a terrific rest of your evening.